Okay. I guess we'll uh, get started. So uh, welcome uh, to the uh, session on demography. Uh, my name's Gary Hansen. I'm a macroeconomist. I teach at uh, UCLA. Uh, and I'm very happy to be here doing this. Um, we're really pleased and we're really fortunate uh, today to have uh, three distinguished practitioners and scholars, very diverse uh, group of people with very different things to say about demography as it relates to, uh, relates to Japan. So what, what I'm gonna do is I'll just call each one of them up uh, in an order that we've prearranged, uh, different than the order there, but, uh, and uh, we, uh, and then uh, they'll each speak in, for about 20 minutes, and then we will have some question and answer and discussion, okay? So our first speaker, is uh, Professor Elena Capatina. Elena is a macroeconomist who has just joined the faculty at the Research School of Economics uh, here at ANU. Uh, she's a Canadian citizen and received her PhD from the University of Toronto in 2011. Before moving to ANU, she spent seven years working at the ARC Center of Excellence in Population and Aging Research at the University of New South Wales. There, uh, there was much research that was carried out on the implications of aging in, in East Asia. Her own research has focused primarily on macroeconomic models of health. So, Without more, I will call her up. So thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you very much for inviting me to this event. Um, so in this talk, I will be um, talking about um, the impact of aging on economic inequality. And specifically, I will look at the effects to health and long-term care provision. Um, so just as an aside, my own research is in the area of health risk insurance and inequality in the US. Now clearly, compared to the United States, Japan is a country that has achieved a higher degree, much higher degree of equity in general, um, and in particular in healthcare and long-term care. Japan is one of the healthiest and most homogeneous and egalitarian nations in the world. However, Japan has entered the era of super-aging, demographic change, and advanced health transition, which is increasingly putting pressure on the sustainability of its health and long-term care systems. And this brings challenges with respect to equality and equity. Looking at the challenges faced by other countries, such as the U United States, provides a, perhaps a cautionary tale for the issues that could arise in Japan as well. So for example, we can ask questions on how do different demographic and socioeconomic groups benefit from the provi uh, provision of universal health care and public insurance for long-term long care. Um, for example, in the United States, research shows that it is, in fact, uh, the wealthier, better off groups that disproportionately benefit uh, from publicly available long-term care insurance that's actually meant for the poor. And that's because uh, the wealthier groups live to um, uh, much older ages, and when they do, they have much more severe health problems and um, more chronic conditions and multimorbidity, which cost them, in the end, a lot more. And after they run down their assets, they rely on the public system. So the same can, um, uh, can be um, asked in, in Japan. Who benefits from these um, uh, publicly provided systems? And also, we can ask the same about the costs of uh, financing. Um, how are they distributed? Who will bear the cost of the demographic transition the most? So clearly, 
It's important to think about inequality since inequality is strongly associated with social, political, and persistent in, uh, economic problems in the long run. Um, now, before I get into um, my talk about Japan, um, I also want to emphasize that aging is affecting all economies in East Asia, and the effects of aging will be felt not only domestically in Japan, clearly, but throughout the region. So the age dep dependency ratio in Japan is 40% now, if we we'll look around here. Um, and that's, of course, projected to skyrocket to 70%. But by 2050, we expect China to be right there um, at 42 percent, um, same for Thailand and, and Vietnam. So all these countries will experience and go through the same thing. And how they face these challenges will have an effect um, throughout the region, especially for China, due to large, its large population and economic size. Um, in fact, by 2050, the UN estimates that um, China will have more people over the age of 60 than any other country in the world. So uh, it's important um, for it to manage this trans transition and the implications will be felt for all. Now, in terms of um, health systems um, in Asia, Japan looks very similar in terms of expenditures per person. Um, as the other advanced nations such as Australia, New Zealand, Singapore. And this is despite the fact that Japan has uh, a much older population. And um, so Japan has been very successful in keeping the costs per person uh, quite low due to a relatively efficient health system. So now in the rest of my talk, I will highlight some of the challenges uh, facing Japan. I'm providing an overview of the challenges that I thought would be um, um, the most important to talk about. However, I, as I said, my expertise is not in Japan, so uh, perhaps the other speakers will um, emphasize some uh, other ones. Um, but um, so I'll be um, talking about um, um, health inequality among the Japanese elderly. Um, aging inequality between different regions in Japan, caregiving uh, and economic inequality, specifically informal care provision, and finally, financing health and long-term care systems and um, the implications for intergenerational uh, inequality. So there are significant differences in life expectancy in Japan between different groups. The most stark ones are between men and women. Uh, life expectancy at birth is only about 82 for males, but 89 for females. Well, of course, in most countries, you see differences between men and women, with women living longer. Uh, this difference is larger in Japan than in other countries. For example, in Australia, the uh, difference is 80 for, for men and 84 uh, for women, so just four years. Um, so this relatively large uh, difference um, in life expectancies uh, means that uh, we can expect relatively long widowhoods for women in Japan compared to other countries. And most widows experience a decline in living standards because of um, the joint household resources that are often uh, depleted by the time the husband dies. Men retire later and die earlier than women. Um, so overall, men spend about five uh, fewer years on public pensions than women. So gender gaps in life expectancy are really important and need to be taken into consideration um, in the pension system reform. Now, a positive aspect about Japan is that while there exists a variation in, in health and mortality by socioeconomic status, as in um, pretty much any other country. This association between socioeconomic status and, and health and mortality is much lower in Japan. And this reflects its more egalitarian system. However, recent research has found that this association is getting larger. So this is a cause for concern. Um, and another um, concern is regional inequality. In a recent uh, article in The Lancet, um, 
it's been found that uh, not only there exists um, health and mortality inequalities between different um, uh, uh, prefectures in Japan, but the differences are getting larger. Um, now, why are these um, differences arising? Well, of course, lifestyle factors are important. Smoking rates vary greatly between prefectures with, um, for example, um, uh, provinces in the north, such as Aomori province, having 45% of men smoking compared to only 35 in Nara province. Um, however, this plays a relatively uh, small role in explaining the overall differences, um, as do health system inputs. So the article makes the point that there uh, needs to be an assessment of subnational health system performance. So here I just want to show you some graphs. Um, about regional, the regional variation across Japan in life expectancy by prefecture. This is for men. Um, so the differences are about three years between um, um, the extreme cases are the Shiga province um, with the highest uh, life expectancy compared to the Aomori province, which has the lowest. And similarly for women, we get a similar picture. Um, now, uh, here the difference is only about three years. I just wanted to highlight that this, well, this is, is not much, but the concern is that it's growing. Uh, however, if we look at China, for example, at healthy life expectancy for women in China, the regional variation is much, much higher, um, much more than 10 years between the poor provinces here and the richer provinces um, here. And this, of course, has implication for a pension reform um, because um, some provinces will um, be able to adjust to a new retirement age and pension withdrawal um, uh, uh, reform uh, much better than other poorer provinces where a life expectancy might even, a healthy life expectancy might be even lower than um, the new um, legislated um, retirement age. Now, the health insurance in, in, in Japan provides um, a, a, a remarkably equitable and low cost um, uh, system, especially relative to other countries. However, as noted in a recent New England um, Journal of Medicine article, um, the achievements in equity are, are now at risk due to aging. Japan still has about 3,500 different insurance plans with varying premium levels. And the, fragment, uh, the fragmentation in the, these insurance plans are differentially affected by, um, uh, this is differentially affected by the increasing number of, of elderly people in Japan. So as people retire, they move from the employment-based plans to non-employment-based plans, uh, putting pressure uh, on, on these. And um, this has been partially addressed by reform in 2000 and 2008. Um, the reform in 2000 addressed the long-term care insurance needs. And in 2008, uh, the government created a new program for the 75 um, and older population. However, problems do remain in the fragmentation of, of, of these plans. Um, so now, long-term care in Japan is, of course, um, has been um, traditionally provided by family. Um, traditionally, it was mainly the daughters-in-law that provided long-term care, but his, this has changed dramatically. Uh, elderly par parents um, live more and more independently, so co cohabitation rates have gone down. Um, with the introduction of the universal long-term care system in 2000, um, uh, this has allowed more people, more carers to, um, uh, to be employed. So about 13% of the population over 65 qualifies for um, public uh, long-term care insurance. 
But here, um, the issue I want to emphasize is that the benefits have been disproportional. Um, so yes, people um, in general have been able to continue employment uh, more as a result uh, of this in, um, long-term care insurance and they provide less care. However, it's mostly the high income groups who have done so. Uh, the low and middle income groups, um, for them, uh, their employment rates have changed very little as a result. So even though uh, long-term care is um, a universal uh, insurance program, there are co-payments, and individuals do have to pay for the food and accommodation uh, when in nursing homes. So uh, perhaps some of the costs are still um, um, impeding some of the low-income groups um, and not allowing um, informal carers to um, go to the labor market, keeping them um, tied to these caring jobs that um, unfortunately um, has implication for inequality as some workers are, are stuck providing care, um, not uh, gaining experience or human capital what, uh, while others are employed and, and uh, can expect uh, future benefits from, from this. Most people do uh, prefer to receive inform, uh, informal care at home, and more and more of the care is provided by the spouses. Um, of course, much of this is provided by women, but the good news is that men are actually providing more of this care. So um, the fraction of male carers has increased from about 11% in the 1980s to about 23% in the, in the 2000s. Still a low ratio, but increasing. Um, however, it's been found that male carers um, often employ additional resources and they suffer from lower rates of depression and stress than women carers. So, um, of course, there are issues around the equity and, and uh, the gender differences in, in informal care provision. So um, finally, I just want to speak a little bit about um, uh, financing the universal um, healthcare system. Of course, due to aging, we'll ex uh, we can expect more and more pressure on the system. Um, so a paper by Xu and Yamada 2017 provides a quantitative uh, analysis on, of the influence of population <laughs> aging on the cost of maintaining the universal health insurance system. Um, of course, um, raising the tax burden would, would be a solution. However, this is not desirable uh, for the working age population as um, it would um, lower the, their labor supply and um, uh, undermine their ability to smooth consumption over the life cycle. Um, so they look at uh, two policies, increasing co-payments for health insurance and consumption taxes. They find that um, both policies would bring significant welfare gains in the new steady states for future generations. Um, however, both reforms have um, harmful effects for the current um, a generation that is close to retirement or have, has already retired, as they have no time to prepare. Um, so here there's a, an issue of um, intergenerational transfers that are needed to compensate some of um, uh, the dem demographic groups, um, because while everybody, as a, uh, as a society, um, everybody will benefit, um, some groups will lose and others will gain. So in conclusion, um, Japan is still one of the most egalitarian nations, and aging has, but, but aging has introduced challenges to equality due to health and long-term care needs. Um, due to the diverse ways through which aging has an impact on inequality, it seems very important to adopt a multidisciplinary uh, perspective. Um, so I was working at, at CPAR, the Center of uh, Studying Population Aging Research um, in Asia until uh, recently. So I just wanted to provide uh, their website. They have a lot of interesting research on, um, that's multidisciplinary uh, on these issues. And I think it's, um, there are many opportunities for collaboration between fields addressing these challenges. So thank you very much.
All right, our uh, next uh, speaker is uh, Professor Hiroko Akiyama. Uh, she's a social psychologist at the Institute of Gerontology of the uh, University of Tokyo. And I believe she founded that institute. Uh, so uh, her research has primarily in her career focused on designing and implementing and studying panel surveys of, uh, of the elderly population. She's worked both in the US and in Japan and uh, with a particular focus on identifying issues related to the physical and uh, mental health of elderly. Uh, in particular, uh, she uh, has tracked approximately 6,000 uh, elderly individuals in Japan uh, over for 30 years. So she's really in a unique position to know what it's like to be old in Japan. So <laughs> uh, with that. Thank you for the kind introduction. Well, I'm delighted to be here and also grateful for the invitation. And uh, my, as uh, Professor Hanson mentioned, my, my background is social psychology. So uh, I look at aging society from individual and community perspectives. Unlike I mean, the previous quite informative uh, presentations and discussion at the macro level, uh, I take a bottom-up approach. <laughs> okay, and um, <clears throat> let me, uh, oh, it's very, right, okay. Well, I mean, I'll start with a very brief description of the background. And as you uh, know, I mean, Japan is a front runner of aging societies. And average life expectancy uh, of Japanese women is now 87 years and 81 years for men. And the current total fertility rate is 1.43. As a result, 28% of the Japanese population is age 65 and older. And in 2030, uh, in the middle, I mean, uh, the uh, graph, I mean, uh, the one third of the Japanese population will be 65 and older. And we expect a drastic increase of people aged 75 and older. And this segment in the orange part, orange part the, uh, this segment of the population will account for 20% of the total population in 2030 and only 12 years from now. Actually, I mean, my mother is I mean, uh, 97, and my aunt just celebrated 100 years, I mean, uh, the birthday in July. So actually, we live long. <laughs> okay. And uh, we have also seen a positive I mean, changes over the years. And we are not only live longer, but also live healthier. And this slide compares the usual walking speed of the people in the same age groups between 1992 and 2002, and the data is a little bit old. And it shows, I mean, older persons in 2002 were 11 years younger than their counterpart in 1992. Uh, in other words, uh, a 75 years old person in 2002 was walking in the same speed of 64 years old I mean, person in 1992 was walking. So, I mean, uh, the, that is, means 11 years younger. And so we continue to see the similar trends in both I mean, physical abilities and cognitive abilities. And in January last year, the Japanese Association of Geriatrics and Gerontology made an official pronouncement to raise the definition of old age from 65 to 75 years old. <laughs> okay. I mean, actually, I mean, almost no one in Japan at in 60s, I mean, they don't think they are old. Okay. They are in the middle age. Okay. <laughs> and uh, 
Well, I mean, uh, as I mean, uh, the, uh, Dr. Hans mentioned, I mean, uh, the, I spend most of my career, I mean, uh, conducting, I mean, the large scale panel survey. And so I have tons of data and statistics. But I think, I mean, uh, the, I feel, I mean, uh, well, I mean, 10 years ago, I mean, I felt, I mean, uh, the, uh, uh, I mean, reviewing all those statics, statistics and also, I mean, everyday life observations, I mean, I felt I mean, we already knew what the issues, okay, uh, and what we need now are solutions and actions. So I switched my research, I mean, directions and also methodology drastically. And uh, <clears throat> one viable approach uh, from the academic community is action research. And the purpose of action research is to solve a particular problem and to produce guidelines for best practice. Well, let me see. And it is, I mean, uh, participatory, I mean, uh, the uh, research in collaboration with multi-stakeholders such as government, uh, industry, uh, various organizations such as NPOs and physicians association and certainly citizens. And it takes a spiral, I mean, of steps. I mean, each step is uh, composed of a PDCA cycles. That is planning, action, and fact-finding about the result of the action. And uh, in my view, uh, the uh, challenges and opportunities uh, in the age, in, in age society, it's a condensed in these two uh, issues, oh, three issues, <laughs> okay, I added. Okay. And uh, for the individual life design for 100 years. And this is a new opportunity, but this is a still, I mean, the, uh, uh, the kind of, I mean, uh, the issues we, we need to me address, okay. And for society, the redesigning the hard and soft inf infrastructure uh, uh, to meet the needs of the highly aged society. And for industry, I mean, promoting new industry by technological and social innovations. Well, the existing infrastructure of communities was built when the population was much younger. And we need to redesign both I mean, hard and soft infrastructure of communities to meet the needs of the, uh, the society where people could live for 100 years, uh, uh, they staying healthy and active and live with a sense of security. And so I am not talking about a retirement community. This is a kind of just a regular community. I mean, uh, the, the people at all ages, I mean, live, okay? And uh, to address these issues, we launched a social experiment in the communities. As this is a social experiment, we evaluate the effects of our interventions at individual level, community level, and the cost. You see here. And uh, we make policy recommendations I mean, based on the scientific evidence. Okay. And so we are running um, several projects, and uh, these are kind of main projects I mean, now we are working on in the community. We have, I mean, two experimental sites, one in a metropolitan area, 30 kilometers away from Tokyo, and the other in rural area. And we chose two quite ordinary communities so that they can be helpful for other communities in redesigning their communities. Uh, the following slides I mean, uh, illustrate the major projects we are now working on in Kashiwa, uh, the uh, in, uh, uh, urban community. Well, I mean, uh, the first project is workplaces for the second life. We live longer and we work longer. As uh, many of you might remember, this is a title of OECD a report published in 2005. A huge number of baby boomers 
who commuted to Tokyo for many years, retired and came back to this community, Kashiwa. And uh, the, uh, we are creating age-friendly workplaces and flexible scheme of employment for the second life. So far, we created nine workplaces, three are in agriculture, two workplaces are food related, and the others are in field of education and uh, personal care. All workplaces are operated by business owners at private sectors, and the wage varies uh, depending on the nature of work, but the minimum wage is guaranteed for all I mean, jobs. And using work sharing, we, uh, and also we call the mosaic, I mean, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the labor, we, uh, mosaic worker, I should say, we develop a flexible employment scheme for both the employers and the senior workers. Other persons, I mean, uh, the older persons decide when and how long they work. So they, everyone work at, at, the, at the, the capacity, I mean, their own capacities, okay? And the management office called Office 7 uh, conducts two-day job seminars for uh, retirees. About 800, I mean, senior are completed, seniors completed the seminar. And the, um, the other uh, important role of Office 7 is matching between jobs and senior workers and support them at the initial <coughs> stage of work. And many of them choose a totally different job from the, uh, the job before retirement. And these are senior workers at work. We have been accumulating the scientific evidence on the effects of working in the second life on physical, cognitive, and social health. And we published the guidebook for helping other communities to start a similar program. Based on our policy recommendations to the national government uh, in, uh, in March 2016, the legislation was passed at the, uh, the national diet to uh, institutionalize this program nationwide. Now uh, the, it is spreading throughout the country. The next project is a frailty prevention. Uh, in the highly aged society, frailty is a dominant cause of disability. And this project promotes frailty prevention in a community and try to raise awareness of physical, cognitive, and social frailty. And uh, the, uh, so I mean, this says, I mean, uh, this slide shows, I mean, uh, the frailty checkup, I mean, conducted by senior citizen supporters. Actually, the senior citizens really actively are involved in the I mean, frailty checkup, annual frailty checkup. I'm just going very quickly, I mean, uh, and uh, the third project, the primary, uh, the, the primary concern of older person is health care. And the national government is promoting the integrated community care system, which provides a home-based medical and long-term care services for 24 hours, the so kind of continuous care. And it is a patient-centered health care system and cooperating with hospitals and the uh, social care services such as mobile meals and transportation services, it provides a total care in the places the patient lives. Three years ago, a combination of independent assisted living facility was built in the central part of the community. Various service stations for home-based health care are located on the first floor of this building. They are the office of doctors who make home visit, visiting nurse, PT, and home helper stations. The pharmacy delivers medicine to patients' home. And all of them deliver their services not only to the residents of this wing, uh, the, uh, facility, but also to the residents of the surrounding community. 
We uh, max uh, the uh, the transportation is a big issue for all the persons to stay safe and uh, the active. Particularly, I mean, uh, the uh, population age 75 and dr will increase drastically, and many of them have difficulty driving uh, cars. Okay. So, uh, in uh, the collaboration with uh, the several companies, and such as Toyota and Nissan, we are working on alternative means of transportation in the community. We maximally, uh, maximally, I mean, utilize existing ICT and AI, I mean, or IoT, whatever, I mean, to a new technology to reach out for people to stay healthy, safe, and connected. This kind of social experiment requires not only the collaboration of researchers in different disciplines, but also full collaboration with local governments, healthcare institutions, NPOs, business community, and residents. We formed the University Industry Consortium on Gerontology in 2009. The consortium provides a platform for academic ideas and business ideas joining together to provide a new values and solutions for the formidable challenges we face in aging society. So far, over 100 Japanese and international enterprises participated in the consortium. Just a list of them. And in 2011, you know, Japan Science and Technology Agency, it's called the JST, a major government research funding agency, uh, created two programs which support social experiment to address uh, priority issues in aging society. So they're supporting kind of action research. And action research is a promising research method, I mean, but still in the formative stage. And we need to work on further developing action research as a robust scientific research method. A few years ago, we published an introductory book of action research in aging society in Japanese. And I hope me action research gets citizenship in the academic community and contribute to solution for enormous, I mean, challenges in the rapidly aging society. Okay, now, now I want to talk about, very briefly, about the Kamakura Living Lab, which we launched last year. And uh, we view 100 years life society is a gold mine of innovation. And uh, we are trying to build a platform for open innovation uh, like this. So, I mean, uh, the, we, have, we have a user community, and then we, uh, the uh, big companies, small companies, startups, and university government, and we have creative commons, I mean, uh, for open resource, okay? And uh, so this is a kind of platform for open innovation. Our Living Lab is a platform for innovation by co-creation with users. It requires multi-stakeholders, uh, citizens, government, industry, and acad academia, so-called quadruple helix. And user communities are not only observed subjects, but also a source of creation. <laughs> In my view, this is a crucially important infrastructure for promoting technological and social innovation. Last year, we launched Kamakura Living Lab. Kamakura is, you might know, I mean, the old capital of Japan, uh, about 50 kilometers away from Tokyo. And this is a front page of the leaflet explaining Living Lab, which we distributed to all households in the community. The core members of the Corridor for Helix are Kamakura citizens, Kamakura city government, the University of Tokyo, and industry. Uh, the, uh, uh, we kind of mean uh, the, um, 
asked me at the corporate division of Mitsui Sumitomo Bank, one of the three mega banks uh, in Japan, to participate because they have I mean, 400,000 uh, the corporate clients I mean, all over Japan. So I mean, we want to in, uh, the, uh, invite I mean, uh, the small, uh, middle-sized and small I mean, uh, the com corporations in, I mean, in kind of mean, uh, different uh, the in particular rural area. Uh, the, because they have good ideas on technology, but I mean, many people, uh, many com uh, small companies are concerned about, I mean, uh, their uh, sustainability. Okay. So, and also uh, other industry, many other companies and startups. I think, I mean, not, uh, I'm very happy to see many young startups are got, get very excited to join this, I mean, uh, the platform for open innovation. And uh, the, uh, we started a transnational uh, living lab with a Swedish living lab, and we are aiming them to serve, I mean, as uh, gateways to Asian and EU market for each other. Okay, uh, well, just mean, I, I mean, very brief I mean, introduction uh, of our project. Thank you for your attention. Um, so, uh, our last speaker is uh, Deborah Hazelton, and uh, uh, Ms. Hazelton is currently a director of the uh, Australia Japan Foundation, one of the four banners of similarly sounding uh, organizations that uh, <laughs> form the basis of what we're doing here today. Um, I don't, they must all do very different things. <laughs> uh, and she's also a member of the boards of an impressive list of, uh, of, of additional boards. But she spent her career in, the, in uh, the global financial services industry and has worked uh, extensively in Japan, I think she said 16 years, uh, as well as Australia, and has held senior leadership roles in both Australian and Japanese banks. Uh, more recently, she's worked with a Japanese mega bank in helping them transform their global workforce to work more effectively and product productively together. So we're stepping from surveying academic research to applying academic research to the real world to real world experience and uh, um, well, conclusions drawn from real world experience. So we'll turn it over to Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Clearly, I am lowering the tone. But look, um, it's the end of the day, and it's nice to have some practical input, maybe. So thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm absolutely delighted to be at this terrific event. So I'm going to talk about uh, Japan's demographic imperatives and what it means for workforce transformation in Japanese firms. Now, um, uh, as we've talked about earlier, the Japanese uh, workforce is really two-tiered. Uh, there is the informal workforce and there is the formal workforce. And in fact, about 40% um, of workers now are seen to be working in the informal workforce. I'm going to be talking from my experience, which is in the more formal, um, structured, traditional workforce. I think the lessons from this area of work are important because they are huge employers. They should be role models in what Japan should be looking at in terms of workforce. And uh, they, they really add a lot to the economy because, in fact, it's their workers that get the biannual bonuses and spend it and have access to credit. So, clearly, uh, that has not... Oh, okay. I'm going to jump ahead here. Sorry, these are not great slides. I didn't test them on this machine. 
Okay, so um, future of work in Japan uh, require, is, is driven uh, to change, and it's driven by demographic pressures as well as the burning platform for uh, business success in Japan. As we all know, uh, if you're looking to grow your business in Japan, you really have to be looking outside Japan as well. If you're not, then your customers will be in many cases. So that means we need um, a much more diverse and inclusive workforce. Now, when we look at these things from a Japanese point of view, from a traditional, certainly traditional big players in Japan, we need to recognize that Japanese employees see their role through two lenses. One is their business drivers to build um, sustainable growing businesses. And the other is through their roles as uh, economic and socially responsible entities for the growth and sustainability of Japanese economy. And this is very, this is felt very strongly still in many Japanese companies. And it became very apparent to me during the Royal Commission over the last month or so, just how different this is in Japan to many of the Australian um, large firms. So there is a burning platform clearly for Japanese big firms to globalize their workforce and to transform their workforce. There are the domestic and um, demographic changes of the aging workforce and labor shortages. There's the pressures of globalization for business growth. The very complexity of business and corporate governance, both in country and globally, requires a different kind of workforce, more agile, creative workforce. And that's linked to the need for innovation and performance improvements. There are a couple of um, ways of dealing with that. Of course, there is uh, automation. A lot of these issues will be dealt with through using automation, but also the people part of the workforce needs to be addressed. I'm going to concentrate on the people, and this is where I'm going to talk about the importance of the diversity of the workforce and what that means in really implementing some of the changes we're seeing coming through, particularly um, workforce change uh, and diversity has got the strong endorsement and, uh, and support leadership of the Japanese government. That certainly helps in Japan. Just briefly, the um, experience I've had was with one of the three mega banks, Mizuho Financial Group, complex group, very big, across 40 countries. Uh, 60,000 employees, um, uh, although big in Japan, um, a big presence in Asia, uh, Europe, and America. So across a lot of different uh, challenges, I was asked to uh, introduce a way that the Japanese in Japan could think more um, creatively and work in a more productive global environment, uh, and how to uh, bring the people from outside Japan uh, into a Japanese firm. So, uh, how are we doing in terms of progress? Uh, clearly, um, we need to diversify the workforce because we need uh, new sources of labor. We need more women. We need more older workers. We need non-Japanese, young and also specialists. We need more differently abled people. We need people who live different kinds of lifestyles. For example, people who identify LGBTQ. We need innovators. That means people who might think differently, might not have gone through the usual uh, Japanese education system, might not have gone straight to um, one of the uh, big Japanese universities. We might have, God forbid, bosses that are younger than, their, than the people who work for them. And that means we have to look at HR systems and policies, for example, 
um, recruitment practices, work-life balance issues, and performance management. Now, to establish the right kind of workplace environment, we can use training and development, of course, but a lot of it is about mindset. A lot of it is about how people engage and work with people who are different. It, I'll stop here for a minute and I'll look at these new sources of labour because it might be interesting to know that, for example, in Mizuho, we had a lot of programs going to, uh, to invite and engage different sources of labour. I mean, this is to address, obviously, the democratic imperatives, as well as to help create a more productive workforce. It wasn't just Mizuho. The mega banks were all doing it, but also the other um, industries in Japan, all recognising the drivers. So for women, we uh, tried to identify the women that we thought could grow into and become leaders. And so we were training them, developing them, setting up next work networks. We were trying to develop the men to help them manage women. Um, seems strange to have to do that, but that's what we had to do. Um, so we had all these programs set up. Uh, to tell you the truth, um, we didn't make much progress in terms of getting women into senior roles. We set targets, of course. Um, we moved some of the targets to tick some of the boxes, but like other industries, but uh, we're still struggling with that one. It's interesting to note that a lot of the increase of women participating in the workplace in Japan are actually going into the informal um, economy, the informal employment uh, area, and that means they do not have access to a lot of the benefits or the economic um, uh, um, contribution. They can't make the economic contribution that, that those in the um, formal network can make. Uh, to attract older workers, we had programs where we would change um, the environment so that when someone retired, we would invite them to reapply for another um, period of time in our uh, institution. We tried to design meaningful roles for them and uh, we tried to make sure that they had the training and development they needed to fulfil those roles. Um, there's still older workers in this kind of environment in Japan, not just in this, in this uh, group, but uh, across their traditional firms, usually take a massive pay cut for the privilege of coming back and using their long-earned uh, experience to benefit the company and society. But, um, you know, that, that's a step in the right direction and hopefully uh, that will be addressed. We try to attract more Japanese, non-Japanese people to come and work with us in Japan, as well as sending our Japanese staff over to foreign countries to work with uh, people from different cultures and backgrounds in the earlier stages of their career. Now, once again, there's a lot of programs going on, um, some more successful than others. Uh, with, the younger, um, with the younger people, they were generally from Asia. They were the kind of um, Mizuho staff that wanted to come work in head office in Japan. Not quite so intimidated by the language, maybe. Willing to take the risk. The pay uh, was an issue with um, bringing people from New York well, no one wants to leave New York, it's the center of the universe. Um, sorry, where's Sheila? Is she here? Sorry. <laughs> but, but also, we couldn't match the pay for a lot of the, the um, European and, and North American um, uh, people, but we, we, we had a lot of success bringing in younger people, and sometimes they brought their families from other parts of the world, particularly Asia, and they worked with us. We still lost more than we wanted. What had happened is they'd work with us, they would add value, they would train. Our Japanese would love working with them, they would love working with us. They didn't want to go back to their home country and work for the Mizuho branch there, so they'd quit and go to a, someone else, maybe a competitor, to stay in Japan. So there was still some 
challenges there. With the, with the specialists, the more senior people, it was even more challenging. And my view on this is that we just didn't go hard enough at it. We would bring some specialist in from uh, somewhere else in the world and give them a, a serious job with a serious title in head office. And uh, it was very hard for them to feel like they were making a difference or a contribution. And I think it was because there wasn't a critical mass. Whether, whether it was right or wrong, they still looked like tokens and they didn't, uh, they didn't feel that they succeeded. So there's still a lot of work to be done there, but there's a lot of work still being done there. Differently abled people, there's a lot of government programs to um, foster the uh, involvement of people with uh, different capabilities or um, uh, sometimes disabled in some areas. Uh, and, and that's been going on for a long time in Japan. But one of the things I was very pleased to see is a kind of different attitude. Uh, one of the uh, groups that was established was a, a sign language club so that the um, regular people in the group could uh, communicate with some of the differently abled people that were coming in now in, in bigger numbers. Um, LG, LGBT uh, Q, uh, people who identify as LGBTQ. This was one of the more um, fun areas and, the, and one of the more uh, successful areas I think we had. And I felt that people were more open to address this as an issue of um, adding value and having more fun and being more diverse compared to the women, the gender equality. I just, there is a real sense in my view of fatigue with this, particularly since we don't seem to be getting anywhere. Um, we had some real success with uh, the LGBT um, uh, education issues. We had to have sessions in Japan where we took the HR people aside and explained what it stood for and why um, it was going to be a great thing to do and so on. People really embraced it. And one of the great things that happened out of that uh, in my few years there was Mizuho was the first mega bank or the first Japanese bank to introduce a system whereby we could recognize the um, same sex partner as an uh, equal contributor to home loan repayments, for example. And this got through the system. Uh, and it came up when there was a young group of people uh, doing an innovators course said, well, this would be a good idea. And it all went through the system. And my theory is that the, the blockers at the more traditional higher management level, not the top management, by the way, but the people who didn't want the change didn't catch it happening. So I, I reckon that this is, this is the way to get things done in Japan in many cases. Innovators, that's just the younger people. Um, or the people who have different backgrounds, don't look or walk or talk the same. We need to be able to attract them, uh, engage them, empower them to make the difference. So uh, we had you know, innovation hubs and different kinds of training for them and so on. This is all going on. Um, it's not successful enough yet, but it gives me some hope for the future. Uh, Work-life balance, of course, is a huge issue if you're going to have people who live different lifestyles, who have different values and so on. You have to make sure that you are uh, recognising people for their output, not their input. We talked earlier about, um, we talked earlier about uh, time spent at work. My view in Japan is the longer you spend at work, the less productive you are in many cases. So. Um, because the people are just exhausted and, uh, and they're not giving their best in terms of creativity. Uh, Work-life balance, we had some terrific uh, targets like 100, we would have 100% um, or a 0% target of people who would leave because they had to care for someone, 0%. No one would leave because they had to care for children or old people or something. Um, we had a great target for men taking uh, paternity leave, 100%. Now, doesn't sound so ambitious, but and it's only five days. But when we introduced that target, it was 0.6% of men were taking that. 
And I remember uh, talking to my team about it and we're having lunch at the canteen. I said um, something about this target and they said, um, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you, Tanabe-san had a baby. I said, oh, that's great. Baby girl or baby boy? And he said, oh, little girl. And I said, oh, that's great. When was she born? Oh, about an hour ago. <laughs> oh, really? You know, so there's a lot to be done. <laughs> um, so uh, we do know, though, that um, uh, Japanese compos companies have struggled, oops, have struggled to meet diversity and best, best practice standards. And there's a lot of potential reasons for that. Um, in terms of gender, in 2016, Japan ranked 111 out of 144 countries in terms of gender um, equality measures. Uh, in 2017, we dropped three points to 114th, um, mainly because of representation in the political and uh, uh, um, cabinet areas. Uh, there are cultural reasons for this. There are structural, organisational region uh, reasons. Education system we know needs to stop educating girls and boys about role idea, you know, gender uh, role models when they're even just starting school. And the, look, a lot of people don't know about this, but the traditional, unique human resource management system in Japan is so different to the rest of the world. We have to remember that, paradoxically, it was introduced uh, at a time when, uh, post-war, when there was a desperate shortage of staff and they had to attract people and keep them and make them work very hard. Now, those systems do not work anymore. This is about recruitment from university, lifelong employment, generalist, uh, hierarchical seniority promotion, and so on. Uh, this has to change. And all these are huge challenges, all ending in the, the huge, ch the biggest challenge, of course, is building the inclusive corporate cultures that can deal with it. We can tick the boxes on diversity, but if the young people are coming in and still being treated, or people from overseas are coming in and still not getting access to decision-making roles, women um, still not be making, a, a, making a real contribution, this is not inclusion, this is just diversity. Can we be optimistic? I think so. Um, just the last couple of years, I've started to see a lot more optimism in terms of um, uh, publications and, uh, and uh, some of the statistics. I mean, with a real shortage of staff, the argument behind keeping zombie companies alive is gone. So hopefully that will mean that we have more productivity in terms of where, um, uh, for example, the banks are supporting their customers. Now, if you're going to have, uh, if, you, if you're going to have a smaller workforce, then surely older, well-trained, dedicated workers are a good place to start. And if you can add to that the new diversity of young Japanese and non-Japanese, this goes to the immigration issue, which is essential. Um, then we can increase the productivity through uh, the diversity of the workforce and the transformation. We really need to see uh, the increase in exclusivity. Um, now, most of you will know uh, about Jesper Kohl. Jesper Kohl's been around for a long time, since the mid-'80s. Um, very respected strategist economist, worked for Merrill Lynch, JP Morgan, advised the... Uh, Japanese government. He's viewed, and he's now with a, a, a think tank, he <coughs> now is saying that um, he's very optimistic about the fact that Japan has hit this kind of demographic sweet spot because of the quantity and the increased quantity and quality of employment. His argument goes that even though the pool of uh, potential employees between 15 and 65, say, is decreasing, participation in the workforce is increasing. 
And if we get that participation rate from 77% where it is now in Japan up to, uh, say, the, the gold standard 83% in Switzerland, there's another 3 million people out there. If you add to that immigration and also um, you change the quality of employment, his theory here is that in the last couple of years there has been a rehiring of part-time um, uh, the informal workforce uh, employees into full-time, uh, then you start seeing this uh, demographic sweet spot. We can also learn from uh, a lot of specific corporate measures. I've been talking about the traditional financial services companies uh, in terms of my experience, but look, they are probably the hardest to move on, really traditional. Um, a lot of corporates uh, in Japan are doing great work. Uh, Catalyst Japan is uh, giving them awards every year. People like Sekyu, uh, Lixel, um, Lixel um, uh, SMBC, uh, as well as uh, foreign firms in Japan like Deutsche Bank and um, Coca-Cola are doing great jobs around diversity and inclusion. We can learn from those. And we're going to have an increased number of millennials in the workforce by natural attrition, particularly if we start bringing in more people from overseas. So we hopefully are looking at a tipping point. Comes back to my point about let's have some critical mass. Let's see these people really making a difference and back them. Uh, and according to Jesper Cole, this is going to be a new middle class that drives um, uh, that drives a transformation of the workforce, that drives um, economic growth and prosperity in Japan. Two of my um, fun slides, this is what we did in Mizuho in terms of setting up women's networks globally, and this was us walking in the Tokyo Rainbow Pride Parade. Um, we were the only bank, Japanese bank, uh, to walk in that in 17. I know there were many more in 18. Daiichi Life was the other uh, Japanese, big Japanese firm to be represented. So I'd like to uh, leave you with maybe three messages. One is that I think there's scope for optimism, even though the challenges are great. I think the way we should look at this is holistically. We need to look at uh, the demographic drivers, the um, gold mine for innovation as a positive, and we need to be looking at these uh, demographic drivers as driving us to look at how we build a new workforce that is inclusive of the diversity it needs to, uh, it needs to embrace. And the third, the third message is publicly, in public companies as well as, or in, in the public sector as well as in the private sector, we really need to convince people that this is not about um, being nice to people. It's about a business case for not only businesses being sustainable and successful into the future, but, but actually the uh, sustainability and the um, growth and, uh, and um, prosperity of the Japanese society and economy. And if we can convince those true leaders and get them to walk the talk, uh, then we can be truly optimistic. Thank you. I'd like to thank our uh, presenters um, but uh, and open it up for questions. Um, do we have any questions? Do I need to ask questions? Oh, okay, we have somebody right there. Thanks, that was uh, all um, very uh, terrifically uh, interesting, some amazing uh, lessons for Australia, our OECD country certainly learned from the initiatives in Japan around um, managing active uh, ageing. Um, I had a question for uh, Deborah Hazelton. Um, you talked about Mizuho. Um, I was wondering if you could talk um, about uh, other types of organisational forms and if you see the same dynamics, sorry, other types of companies and uh, whether you see the same dynamics. One of the things that's very noticeable, certainly in Tokyo, if not the regions, 
um, these days is a rise uh, of small, fairly internationalized companies, often headed by um, uh, women, uh, Japanese women, who are multilingual in many cases. Um, so there's a real, in addition to the needs to, you know, to, to, to kind of uh, uh, refresh organizational culture within the large traditional companies, it seems to me that there are a lot of other types of organizational forms which are also grappling um, with those issues. So if you had any insights about those organizations, it would be great to hear them. Uh, thank you. That's a great question. Um, so as I said, there's this there's, there's, um, uh, informal uh, employment uh, area and, and the more traditional established employment area. The, um, in terms of the big companies, before I start, um, there are some great uh, initiatives and real progress in, um, particularly in the uh, health industry in Japan and in the technology industry and also in consumer goods. Um, still probably more challenge than some of those informal um, areas where you've got young, young people, innovators starting up new businesses. I think uh, for them, and they, I don't know how much they're struggling with setting up the diverse workforce. I think they do that. That's how they, that's how they succeed. But they're, they're challenged in other ways in terms of the um, sustainability of their business model because of all the other uh, things going against them. And I guess what I would like to see and what I tried to do at Mizuho is I tried to look at what they were doing well in terms of their um, more innovative and um, uh, uh, modern, for want of a better word, workforce mix. Um, I think we could really learn from them. The, the reason I think it's worth looking at the big traditional firms is they are still massive employers, and unless we can get them over the line as well, then the impact certainly is not going to be as great. Uh, a lot of reason, you know, so one of the reasons that we struggle getting um, innovative, uh, uh, brave young women, for example, to join a traditional firm like Mizuho is they, all they have to do is take a, a look and say, well, I'm not going to get anywhere there based on my merit or, or um, maybe what I deserve because of other reasons. So I'm going to go into a startup, but much riskier, of course, and much, uh, and much less rewarded, often less pay, um, don't have access to credit, don't get the uh, you know, other benefits that go with um, those big firms. Uh, but, but they've got the opportunity. Um, I worry about, uh, you know, how many cycles of a failure of a startup can they go through before they just give up and don't, either don't come in or they put up with, with the nonsense that goes with coming into those big firms. When I um, tried to uh, recruit some of those women, they, they had no interest. Uh, but then I did have visits from some of them later who said their parents or their husband or someone had actually pressured them after, after a failure or something going wrong in these small startups to actually come back to the big firms. And it was unsatisfactory for everyone. Question? A question, um, I think, for um, Deborah um, about the compulsory retirement age at large Japanese corporates. I remember losing a very talented uh, school principal at an international school in Japan who turned 60 and the board came to him and explained that he could uh, would have to retire immediately and come back to do exactly the same job as principal for half the pay. He had just um, adopted three children um, <laughs> and so was a new father at 60. Um, he left Japan and has had a wonderful career in China for the last 15 years um, as a result and Japan lost him. And I'm just wondering what prospect is there that that very hard 
um, cutoff point with this forced retirement at a certain age, which is far below what we understand old age now is, and why it persists. Um, Yes, so uh, actually anybody could answer this question. Mm. Well, no, no, why, I'm why just... Why that persists I'm, when it's so I'm thinking how I can either get under the table or pass the question. <laughs> no, the, 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 uh, for, so from a practical point of view, I saw a lot of effort in changing those rules. And, uh, you know, at the very senior ranks, of course, you go off to, you know, to another senior position to look after a, a related company or something, which is still a loss in many cases to the firm. Um, and... Uh, you know, you get compensated in different ways. But most people would be told that they need to retire at, at that, that um, at a certain age. They are looking, I know in our firm we were looking at increasing that age, but also we had come up with some creative ways of getting the person back. And um, they would take a pay cut, certainly, but um, we tried to uh, manipulate, manipulate's a bad word, but we, we tried to increase the salary uh, with other duties or something to make it more attractive. So there's all kinds of things going on to address it, um, but I, in, from a policy sense, I don't know. Um, perhaps Professor Akiya can help us. Well, I mean, uh, I'm working with, I mean, uh, labor economists, and I'm not economist. But I, I think, I mean, uh, the uh, long-term, I mean, uh, the direction of uh, the Japanese government is, I think, going to ageless society. And so, I mean, uh, the, uh, well, I mean, uh, the first of all, I mean, uh, as I mentioned, I mean, uh, the, uh, we live longer, but also we stay healthier. Okay, so we have, I mean, the large, I mean, uh, the kind of human resource is 60 or 65 and older. And uh, we are not using that resource very effectively. And also, I mean, no one is happy about this kind of keizoku koyo, I mean, uh, the, uh, the continuing employment for them. I mean, just terrible, I mean, uh, the, uh, and uh, so, I mean, uh, the, but I think you can't change this uh, long, I mean, uh, the tradition, I mean, immediately. And uh, we're in Japan, so it's uh, the older workers, I mean, uh, the healthier, and also the, the best thing is that they are willing to work. I mean, uh, they are actually wish to work. I mean, stay in, engaged in uh, the uh, work or I mean, society. And rather than, I mean, getting, I mean, just pension, I, they want to contribute to the society, okay? So, I mean, uh, the... Um, now, I mean, uh, the, uh, as you know, I mean, the, some uh, European country, I mean, raised I mean, retirement age to 65 to 67, or thinking about 70. But, I mean, where I think that is, I mean, one of the options, I mean, uh, in Japan. But I think, I mean, uh, the, in my view, I think we, uh, the, the raising retirement age is not very wise. I mean, uh, the uh, policy, because, I mean, after age 65 and older, it's very, I think, just like, I mean, uh, the second half of the marathon, I mean, people, workers are very diverse in terms of uh, uh, the physical ability, cognitive ability, and also the time available. I mean, uh, I mean some, for some people, I mean, uh, free for 24 hours. Some people are taking care of I mean, aging parents or, I mean, a spouse. Uh, so it's, and their time is limited. So I think, I mean, we need to, uh, I mean, uh, make ageless society. So, I mean, I think, I mean, the lifetime kind of, I mean, uh, engagement in life, but it's in the capacity each person can do. I mean, uh, so, I mean, I think we have to create, I mean, kind of flexible employment system. And I mean, just drop. I mean, retirement, mandatory retirement age. Mm -hmm. yeah. do, as a follow-up, do you, do you find evidence in your research that people who continue working that want to work do they live longer? Uh, is that good for we're, their mental yeah, health? Yeah, we're actually. I think that is what I mean. Uh, the kind of data we are accumulating. The current I mean, uh, the statistics. I think I mean uh, the uh, the proportion of all the people in working mm -hmm. and also uh, the healthcare expenditure per individual. Uh, 
uh, uh, kind of mean, uh, the uh, mildly correlated, but we don't know the causal relationship. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, we are kind of mean assessing the, uh, the senior workers, I mean, uh, the physical, cognitive, and social health before start working and six months, eight, 12 months, 18 months later. And uh, so, and so far, I mean, uh, we have some, I mean, uh, positive effects, but we need more data. My question is to uh, Professor Akiyama. Towards the end of your presentation, you mentioned this uh, experiment or the, uh, between uh, one in Japan, one in Sweden. I wonder if you could um, talk, talk about that uh, to us and if, and if you could refer whether there were much similarity between Japan and Sweden, or lots of differences uh, between those two countries. I'm very interested in uh, okay. hearing about them. Well, I mean, uh, this is about a living lab, okay? Uh, we are kind of trying to form a transnational living lab between Sweden and Japan, okay? And I think, I mean, the, the, uh, we share many issues. I mean, uh, so now we, we are focusing on four issues. Uh, employment, I mean, Sweden also, the older people need to work. Employment and uh, housing and mobility and the loneliness and kind of mental health issue. And so we share the common issue, but in kind of different sociocultural context. So we are, I mean, solution might not be the same. So that's kind of interesting thing. So I mean, uh, so we kind of mean uh, they solve the issue, for example, I mean, uh, the housing or mobility, and we test and we kind of mean pro create, I mean, some mobility. But we can't sell that I mean uh, the, uh, the car or whatever directly to Europe, EU, because I mean, there, it, there are some cultural differences in terms of I mean, their lifestyle or social system or companies, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, management system or whatever. So I think, I mean, uh, the, uh, we have two living labs, and so we need to test the Swedish living lab before we go into the I mean, uh, EU market. Yeah. Okay, so I'd like to join the, the discussion about the extending the retirement age. So the, my question is the, whether the extending the retirement age is uh, consistent with the current working custom in Japan. I mean a seniority system, you know. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, I, you know, because I, I think, um, especially Deborah knows that, you know, at the Mizuho or major banks, you know, you need to be a division chief maybe after working 10 years or, you know, that kind of things are determined. So that, uh, Professor Akiyama mentioned the age of the society. That means it's not just about the extending the retirement age. Maybe we need to kind of demolish the, such kind of the working circle. That's the first question. And I'm also interested, uh, very much impressed with the Elena's you know, presentation about the aging and the inequality thing. And uh, maybe you show the modeling result that uh, you know, it may increasing the tax and the reducing the benefit could be the good idea, but uh, some generation may experience a lower welfare or something. Therefore, do you kind of suggesting some you know subsidy kind of thing may be helpful. But uh, can we make everybody is you know welfare improving situation or you, any any kind of the you know maybe the policy may end up with the, some generation may worse off or can we make uh, everybody's win win kind of situation? These are two questions. Do you want to go first? Um, sure. Yeah. So I can address the last question uh, that. Um, Relates to my talk. Um, so over, overall, in the experiments where um, the co-insurance rates increase or the consumption taxes increase, in both of those experiments, everybody is eventually better off in a new steady state. As you noted, along the transition, some age groups will be worse off. Now, I think there is enough, there are enough benefits coming from the new steady states that can be redistributed to the current generation that, that's losing out. Um, so of course, and, and those groups would have to be compensated to make 
any such policy political, politically feasible. Um, so yes, I, I would say because the gains are in the long run, they can definitely compensate for a short term loss or, or subsidy to be paid out. Shall I talk about this? So in terms of um, uh, seniority uh, promotion systems and so on. I'm getting orders, so I like this. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got it. <laughs> well, you know, I did, I, I uh, tried to mention that, um, you know, all these policies and systems have to be changed if we're really going to transform the workforce and if we're going to build a, a more diverse and, and inclusive workforce to do that, to, to, to meet the requirements. Uh, policies around uh, recruitment have to change, policies around performance management have to change, and policies therefore around um, a, a promotion and so on have to change. So uh, there, were, there was a lot of work done on that. And it's very clear that you can't have um, everything's wrong about a system whereby you hire everyone uh, on the same day, virtually, uh, every year, and have them come in as cohorts and set them against each other because the triangle's this shape, and if they want to be, they want to be promoted uh, in their cohort, then the number has to decrease, they have to survive. Um, Therefore, uh, it's not going to promote much collaboration. They have to look better than their competitor. And, uh, and also, they don't want to take any risks, right? Because in the old system, if you made a mistake, then that meant your potential for moving up the ladder and being promoted was diminished. So all that has to change. Uh, so the um, hierarchical promotion system uh, was very much uh, uh, under under pressure and was changing dramatically. There was still a lot of pushback, of course, you know, um, and uh, it, it, the uh, mantra was that uh, actually we will reward people for taking risks if it was for the benefit of the firm or the customer or so on, uh, even if they failed, because that shows, you know, bravery and courage and, and commitment and innovation, all those things. And so you might get start to get younger people being promoted over their cohorts and then over their seniors. Um, the management challenge to those guys, and they were all men, maybe, um, but for one, um, uh, the management, it, it, there was still the problem with the lack of inclusion, right? Because uh, then you had people who felt they had this boss forced upon them who was younger than them. And so unless they had a truly inclusive mindset, recognised the value of it, it still didn't work. So it comes to that tipping point, comes to enough examples of how it can work, how it can be fun, how it can be good for the company and the customer. Uh, until you do that, um, you, can't, you can't get the benefit of changing the policies, but you've got to start with the policies. So that's why I reckon if we keep going and seeing the good examples, uh, we'll get to a tipping point. Okay, we are out of time. Did, I mean, I know you had a question. Do you, do you want to ask quickly? Or? Well, I, I was going to ask Deborah. Uh, I do research on females, and uh, being, you, you being on the top of the Mizuho, and also as a, you know, in a sense, outsider of the culture. I do know that there are some progress. There is some progress. If you look at statistics, there are some, some statistical significant progress, even though the gap is still so large between males and female promotion, I mean, the rate of managers. But what is the actual step that you think? Well, first, I was going to ask a different question, but because uh, Ipe's question was quite uh, good. And, uh, so, so what is the actual step that we can take that you recommend? Uh, for us, I, I totally agree with you with a fundamental change in employment system, but what is the first step that we can take in that direction that can be uh, supported in the sense of productivity and in the sense of the inclusion and <laughs> yeah. Well, you choose, choose the right company. Make sure you've got sponsors, more than one, right? And in a Japanese firm, very difficult, you might 
join, have a sponsor, and then they get promoted out or um, aged out or sidelined and rotated. Uh, so you need to build sponsorship. These are all with men, senior men. Um, my view is to try to create that, uh, that inclusive environment by pulling up the other people who are different around me so, so, it, so you don't stand out as the, as the token strange one. Um, and then also, you know, the resilience, uh, the generosity of spirit to always look at the, you know, you, you, when you bang down to always look for the positive um, opportunities that come with that. And, uh, and uh, you know, a lot of luck, I think. <laughs> but, um, but I think you need to establish this network around yourself of the other women you're working with, as well as the other people who are different and, and support what you're trying to do. And that makes a huge difference. And that's a challenge for people from different backgrounds too, because they don't have the natural network of coming from the same university and so on. And the people who are taking off early to care for people and so on, it's harder for them. So the challenges are there, but I think having that support network and believing in yourself is, you know, the way to go. Okay, we're definitely over time. Uh, so I want to thank again our presenters and uh, turn it over to Veronica. Well, thank you so much to uh, our last uh, group of panellists. So I just want to close out the update today with a word of thanks, and I'd ask you to show your appreciation at the end. So first of all, to uh, our, all of our speakers and our chairs today, we've had some really outstanding presentations, uh, some of the very best in the history of the update, and I'm going to suggest that those are correlated with the high proportion of expert women that we've had speaking. <laughs> I want to thank you, our audience, for uh, participating very much in the spirit of uh, the Japan Update, which uh, is one of having a really informed discussion that's also very candid. I want to thank my co-conveners, um, uh, Shiro Armstrong and Ippe Fujiwara from the Australia-Japan Research Centre, who did much of the uh, intellectual work on forming the program for this year's update. Um, Gary, you were joking about the, uh, the banners. Um, the banners matter a lot to us because uh, what they represent is the uh, support ecosystem uh, in Australia for really thinking deeply about the Australia-Japan uh, relationship. And so I want to underscore our thanks to the Australia-Japan Foundation, to the Japan Foundation and to the Embassy of Japan uh, who together make uh, this update series possible. And finally, and most importantly, on your behalf, I'd like to thank the invisible helpers today, uh, Will Zhou, uh, Hang Dang, Thomas Holm, uh, Arun Mumarati, and also the rest of the AJRC team, particularly the student volunteers who have run the microphones uh, tirelessly today and who've made the, uh, the logistics possible. So I want to invite you back to continue the conversation at this time next year, but in the meantime, thank those who made today possible. Thank you all.